Welcome to Crime Most French, a weekly podcast taking you through intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Research and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open le vin and let the mayhem commence. This week's podcast will be a little different from the others. Not only will there be more of my Scottish brogue to listen to, but there will be no courts, no judges or guillotine, but just a 130-year-old missing persons case. A case that stretches from Dijon in the east of France, stopping in at Leeds in the UK, then across the pond to New York in the US of A. All aboard for the tale of Louis Le Prince. We are in Paris, March 1895, in the Society for the Development of National Industry, in front of a small and very influential number of people who were shown a short film, La Sortie L'Usine Lumière à Lyon, Workers Leaving the Lumière Factory. Produced and directed by Louis Lumière and along with his brother Auguste became known the world over for being the forefront of early cinema. But there's only one problem. This isn't the first short film ever made. Not only that, this isn't the first film shot by a Frenchman. For that we need to rewind back to 1888, a whole seven years earlier, to Leeds in the UK and watch Round Hay Garden Scene which shows people walking around the garden. It's never going to win an Oscar, there's not much character development or a big action scene and the special effects are terrible, but this is believed to be the oldest piece of film in existence. And in the film we see the family of Louis Le Prince, the man behind the film. But wait, you've never heard of him. And what could only be described as a plot from an Agatha Christie novel, Le Prince took a train and was never seen again. We'll find out the sad tale of Louis Le Prince and why he's largely unknown. So who was Louis Le Prince, and why are the history books now rewriting him as the father of cinematography? Le Prince was born 28th of August 1841 in Metz, in the east of France, near Germany and the the Luxembourg border. His family referred to him as Augustin, which morphed into Gus, speaking with his English friends. His father was a major in the army, so he was a middle-class background, unlike most of the other subjects that we've talked about. He had a good education, he came from a a comfortable background. And one of Louis's friends is an artist and photographer, Louis Daguerre. And if you're French and you know anything about photography, you'll have heard of Daguerre and the daguerreotype process of photography. What's interesting about the daguerreotype process, we're di- digressing here, but it doesn't matter. One legend is he discovered it by chance, like penicillin. Oh. So he was working on a way to print pictures on plates that would last and wouldn't take days. Because before that, he was working, Daguerre was working with Nice for Niep, which is impossible to say because it's not Niep, it's Nieps. Uh, <laughs> they actually is the other way. It's, it's impossible to say the way it's written. And they had a process, but the... The exposure times were in hours or days. Wow. And for example, there's a famous scene at the street corner where we see somebody having his shoes. Yes, yes, I know that one. That took several hours. And Mm. the only reason why we see them is because the guy was standing having his shoes polished for a very long time. Otherwise, everybody in the street has disappeared as ghosts. They do. It's it's kind of funny. As you say, there there are these two figures that, that look kind of in focus. And then everything else looks very spectral. It looks very creepy. It's a really good photo. Yes. But they had problems because that took, too long, that, that took way too long. Oh, and yeah. also mm-hmm. the fixation wasn't very good. So one day he put some of, some of his plates in the cupboard. And when he came the next day, they were all processed, essentially. And he couldn't understand why. So he decided to look into it. So he took everything out of the cupboard and added everything back in one by okay, one with yeah. new plates to see if it mm-hmm. was happening. And eventually, having done that, he didn't find out what it was. After thinking about anything that could possibly be involved, he realized that there was mercury in, ah. in the paint of the cupboard. And because it was releasing a little bit of mercury all the time, the mercury deposited on the silver nitrate and fixed the photo. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's the way the dead girl type was, was born. That's one legend, though, is told by one of his friends, and nobody else has oh, told that can story, verify and we don't know more than yeah. that. Well, that's a good legend. I'm, I'm I'm always very surprised when I hear tales of, of from around about that time, that kind of like belly pock time, 
wherein everybody's either in an opium den or out of their head on gin or they're putting lead on their face or, you know, it's just everybody was absolutely either on speed or stoned and uh, the, the whole, the, there was lead in the pipes. It's just craziness. As a species, I don't know how we managed to survive, but we did anyway. As we say, we digress. Let's get back to the story. So as I said, Le Prince had a very good education and he studied painting in Paris and then he went on to study both chemistry and physics at Leipzig, uh, which no doubt gave him a good artistic and scientific grounding, uh, which helped him on his way to invent both the cameras and uh, projectors for, for cinema. Once he'd uh, finished his studies in Leeds, he went to join... The workforce was one of his friends who he went to university with, and he became an agent at the brass foundry uh, that made valves and components. And when he was over there, it was the sister of the friend, Elizabeth Lizzie Whitley, who has been described as a a, a talented artist who um, Le Prince married in 1869. They both went on to set up the Leeds Technical School of Art, specialising in tinting and firing of photographic images on enamel, ceramic and glass. They even produced a commissioned work for Queen Victoria. Could find no word about whether she was amused by it or not. That kind of builds on the time he spent um, in Daguerre's studio, you know, giving him a good grounding on working with. Uh, capturing images. He returned back to France in 1870, where he enlisted to join the um, National Guard during the Franco-Prussian War. It was a very savage time for for Paris. The the siege, I'm not too sure exactly how long, I mean the war itself was only two years long, I'm not too sure how how long the siege of Paris lasted, but... uh, It was pretty much the whole war, I don't remember. So so the whole two years, and famously um, the inhabitants were resorted to eating rats and even zoo animals. Yes, the zoo was decimated, yeah. It's little wonder that Louis arrived back in Leeds uh, entirely exhausted and, and emaciated. During the siege, big restaurants were still open and they were serving things like elephant steak on paper sauce or whatever. Mm-hmm. Some weird recipes with yeah. weird animals in them. I just I just have an image in my head of uh, Blackadder go f- goes forth with uh, Baldrick producing rat au vin for, <laughs> for Blackadder. Well, that was pretty much that, yeah. So, so it, was, it was, in fact. And for history fans out there, there'd be another year uh, where Bismarck would glue the gained territories from the three conflicts of Prussia, which was Austrian War, which was the one previous, and I think there was one with Holland and the Lowlands, and these territories were glued together and, uh, in 1872 that uh, established modern-day Germany. So meanwhile, back with our story, Louis and his family have moved to the USA. The Whitley brothers decided to open up um, business in the USA, and they would live in New York. The business wasn't doing great, so Le Prince decided he would open a decorating business. But once again, not not the best financial decision in the world. So he ended up managing a group of French artists that were painting panoramic pictures. I think they were predominantly battles. So you 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 were this this idea obviously sunk in his head of complete immersion into the actual image itself. Okay. While he was obviously in uh, the States, he obviously had an idea in his head. Well, maybe if we can go from panoramic, maybe we can get moving pictures. And it was in 1886 that he first filed for patent in Washington. The patent was method of apparatus for producing animated pictures of natural scenes and life. He outlined a camera that had 3, 4, 8, 9 or 16 number of lenses of the same focus fixed on a vertical plate. And in this time, once the camera was was being developed, John Whitley, which would be his father-in-law, would overcome some financial difficulties and intended to hold a big exhibition at Earl's Court and also in the States and part of this exhibition would be Louis's new camera. 
But Le Prince seemed very like most inventors of that time. He was very pernickety. He would only show it if it was up to his standards and all the problems had been ironed out. So that exhibition for him never happened and nobody saw his camera. And the year next year, Gus and his wife uh, decided to move back to Leeds to be near the family and also to be near John Whitley's factory for the instrumentations that would obviously help him with the machining of the camera. Also in this time, he would go backwards and forwards to Paris because his mother was very unwell. So he must have spent a lot of time on, on the road. And on the boat. Yes, and on a boat, yes, very true. <laughs> no channel, unfortunately, for... No, and going to the US by boat would take like a week, so... Yeah, that's very true. During this time, while the patent was trundling through in Washington, he also filed for patents in London, Belgium, Vienna and Paris. So that's for the camera? That's for the, yes, the multi-lens camera. So in 1888, he was writing to, to Lizzie that the, the movement from the 16 lenses were still very jerky, so he still wasn't entirely satisfied with it. Also, there must have been a problem of uh, parallax with 16 lens. Yes, well, that's very true. Because even though they're closely grouped, probably... They yes, still they're have... not exactly. Please don't mention parallax. <laughs> Cedric has, a, has a, a very complicated camera, and I know all about parallaxes and the problems of them, but please give us a quick uh, rundown of what parallax is. Well, parallax is just the fact that when you target one object from even slightly different positions, you see a slightly different angle and a slightly different picture of it, and that's, for example, how you brain see stereo. Mm -hmm. It is 3D because your two eyes have enough space between them to produce two slightly different pictures. And when yeah. you merge them, you yeah. can see um, depth. Yes, if, 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 if you look through one eye and then look through the other, you'll see that the image is slightly different. Yeah, so yeah. with 16 lenses, you would, there would have been a parallax problem for mm. the film. Yeah, well, definitely. So it was around about this time that he switched to the single lens. Makes more sense, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And this is the camera that he used to take that previously mentioned Round Hay Cottage film, which I think will be linked to on the yes, uh, it will be on the page yeah, on the so website. So, so you you can watch. It's not very long. It's as I say, fifteen seconds. Yeah, so. I mean, yeah. If we're, we're we're talking the first image, first moving image. You know, if it's it's not bad. We can time the making of the film precisely because it was made. Ten days before um, Le Prince's mother-in-law sadly passed away. And, so she, and she appears in the film. She does. She appears in the film, yes. That's a good way to prove. It's a good alibi if mm. you had murdered someone. Yes. Yeah, it's a short, short, short of one of them actually holding up uh, a newspaper. A newspaper. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's 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 second best, pr presumably. Yeah. So with with this done, he makes an amendment to the to the patent in London with his improvement and with the mention of the single lens. And the single lens is a very important thing in the patent, especially in the States, and especially with one man in particular, who we we'll all know and who I'll mention later. As at this time, the spectre of financial problems rears its head. We know that the, fa the, the father-in-law, John Whitley's company, was having financial problems in the U.S., but also, Louis took out a, a large uh, debt to a Mr. George Nelson. But we don't know exactly why. I mean, presumably, we, we know that research and development uh, stages of anything is the very pricey part of any product or service. You know, so you do need, that's when you need the financial backing. But anyway, regardless, sadly, Nelson died away and the family were there drumming the fingers saying, yeah, where's where's our money, Le Prince? Where's our money, Le Prince? And so th there was strain on the family that they, you know, they had money woes. Okay, they were middle class, but they weren't exactly bathing in money. And at this time, Louis needed to go and visit his brother in Dijon because they needed to resolve the inheritance of, his mother, who sadly died away in spring in 1887, so, so three years earlier. And he went with friends who were just referred to as the Wilsons, and he went across to 
the Channel. They stayed in Brittany, but they arranged to meet him in uh, the Gare du Nord at a specific time on a specific day. Do we know for sure who these people are? Because I vaguely remember from reading a long time ago that nobody found any trace of those Wilsons, that mm. people were doubting they even, even existed because they weren't really involved in his life or anything, and suddenly they appear, and suddenly he dies, and... Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't I know. I really remember that some people have looked into the Wilsons, and nobody uh, can and find nobody anything. Knows. So it's one of these self-perpetuating, it's been cited in one... At one article yeah. and then everyone else is suddenly yeah exactly yes but uh, regardless of of who they, they were before Prince left for Dijon he had packaged and created up the single lens camera it was going to be he would nip across nip in inverted commas because you can't really do nip anywhere at, the, at that time but he would go and visit his brother Albert in, in Dijon and then he would go touch back in Leeds take it to take the crate and everything across to Liverpool and then head across on by boat to New York where he would start exhibiting this single lens camera and obviously the film, much like the Lumiere brothers did, get influential people to look at it and uh, get it out there and, and start rolling yeah, and in the money. Yeah, then get financing for exactly. producing it. Yeah. Exactly. According to the story with the Wilsons, they turned up back in Leeds, sans Le Prince. And they, were, they were on their own. And it was, hmm, very strange. What's happened to Louis? Nobody has seen Louis. Nobody knows where Louis is. He's vanished. According to the last story, he got on the train to Dijon, a later train, a non-express train, later than he was due to meet the Wilsons. And he, they would have been late. But still, regardless, he got on the train. And simply vanished. What are the theories? What happened to Louis? I'll go through these in order of, of, I would say, interest. The first, rather, I would say almost sadly predictable, given the, the, the time, is that Louis was gay. I mean, we, we, can, we can see, you know, people around about the same time, like Oscar Wilde, who ha was married and who, who did have children, imprisoned, and you, you always kept your sexual orientation if you weren't heterosexual to yourself so the story goes that he agreed with the family that he would disappear and move to Chicago and he he died in Chicago not not a huge number of years later but there's only one problem with that story there's been extensive searches is that right have they Yes, yeah. some people have searched all the cemeteries around Chicago and no trace of absolutely no no I mean unless he changed his identity. But uh, to to but me, what would be the point if you all you want yes. to do is leave the country? Why would you change your identity? Yeah, it well, make sense. that is very true. But um, I, I, reading his letters to to his wife uh, at such a time where nobody he wouldn't know that anyone else would be reading them. There is a you know a tender fondness. You, you can tell that he loves his wife. I, I don't find that a very plausible story. It's also not supported by evidence anyway. No. So, so I think we could probably uh, discount that one. The second was he made it to Paris. So he, the, the, tri the later train from Dijon arrived and he was picked up by a Parisian taxi driver who killed him and threw him into the Seine. This story started circulating at the turn of the century, I think it was 2003 maybe, that a photograph of a John Doe was unearthed in the police archives of a body of an unknown male. And that was uh, considered to be, well, that could be Le Prince. Yeah, in a way that it could be pretty much anyone else as well. Mm. Because really the photo is not good. No. He has some facial hair that was very common at the time. Yeah. All you can see really is that he has... Two eyes, one mouth, one nose, and some hair on his face. Mm -hmm. It could be anybody. And also, when I tried to find the source of that information, I couldn't find who was the person who discovered that mm -hmm. photo and where exactly it came from. Because there has been people searching the archives from the police in Paris. And the only answer they got over the last 30 or 40 years is, we have no trace of that person in our record. Yeah. So... Yeah. I think I think there was also the fact that, that Le Prince I think was well I think he was a good bit over six foot and the um, the body that recovered was just too short. It was too short, yeah. Okay. So it's <laughs> not him then. Yeah, I, 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 you know, it just, it just that 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 would be unfortunate, but you know, yes. plausible, but it just doesn't seem to be very likely. 
The next theory is, well, due to all these heavy financial burdens on his back, he decided to end it all and jump from the train somewhere and nobody ever found the body. Because, I mean, that is a long journey, Dijon to um, to Paris will travel through a lot of empty wilderness. If you jumped out at the right place, yeah, I guess your body could be discovered by some wildlife and scattered to the to the breeze. Possibly, but at the same time, the camera would have been found in the train. The camera wasn't with him. The ca- remember, the, the, the camera was back in Leeds. Ah. But I don't think his suitcase was ever found. So, yeah. Well, you can't jump with a suitcase. You can't really yes. jump with a crate. No, no, because these, these cameras, as you can see in the photos from the museum in Bradford, um, these are quite, they look quite big cameras. Oh, yeah, they're not brownies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're not even kind of like, even the first camcorders from the 1980s are smaller than these things. <laughs> these are big things. But also it doesn't make sense. Why would he have done that? Well, yes, that, that that's it. The, the Le Prince family entirely dismissed it, said it was, you know, he never, ever suffered from depression and... Honestly, to to jump so through so many hurdles with the with the camera and filming stuff, getting to almost the you know the checkered flag, the end line, to have gone through all of that and then to have gone, you know what, I just can't face life anymore. That seems highly illogical that he would just jump off of a train when he's right on the verge of success. Yeah, that doesn't make any yeah. sense at all. Spending all your life trying to develop one thing and mm-hmm. having just done it yeah. and being like the day. Before you're going to demo it to rich people who are going to invest in it, you yeah. decide that you have enough. That's it. That makes no sense. That's it, exactly. I mean, he'd even demonstrated the single camera to um, one of the directors of one of the operas and opera houses in, in, in Paris. Yes. So it, it's, it's just, it just doesn't seem logical. If you're suffering from depression, the last thing you want to do is even get up and have a shower. You know, you're not going to be hustling for business when you're, you know, when you're, when you're in, in the, the bowels of, of depression. That one's ludicrous to me. The next one is the most interesting one, is the juiciest one, is the one that you would think would be a, made into a, a film. And this kind of starts, the, the grain of which starts is when Le Prince had left New York to return to Leeds, the story was that it wasn't just that he wanted to be uh, near family and near near equipment and stuff. He was trying to avoid industrial espionage. He w- he was really worried that he might have his invention stolen. And if you add to that the even more outlandish tale of probably the man who's most associated with uh, the invention of cinema, Thomas Edison, I found one entirely fantastical story of um, a New York film student doing research and finding one of Thomas Edison's notebooks. And and in this, this notebook, they had Edison outlining the fact that the deed uh, had been done in Dijon and and how he was uh, uncomfortable with the fact that you know he was an inventor and this was murder. And it was entirely... A com- almost a, 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 a semi-veiled confession that he was behind bumping this Frenchman off who was going to be stealing his thunder. But Edison was evil, but he wasn't stupid. No. Where would he have kept that note, though? Yeah, that as, as, as I previously said, and, I, and I'm sure he probably would have heeded my words, never keep a murder book. Yeah, uh, exactly. These things are always discovered. Exactly. When you get a note from, if you hire somebody to kill someone and you see the note, the deed's done, the note gets burnt the second after that. You don't mm-hmm. keep that in your yeah. archive. And uh, this, this article even claimed that the notebook had been verified of being from the time and, and being Edison's. Sadly, this student doesn't exist and there's no evidence of him. So it just seems to be a giant hoax. And somebody's obviously getting far too carried away with the fact that this is, you know, an unfortunate story. And much as Thomas Edison is a deeply unpleasant man, very litigious. Yeah, I don't I really don't see him being at the hands of uh, somebody's dead. That's that's very uh, very unlikely. And if any Edison family are listening, I'm sure he was a wonderful guy thoroughly driven and a decent bloke and would not have anything to do with anyone's death. Also, we know for, for a fact that Edison had people working at the patent office. Oh, yes. So he didn't need to kill no. someone to steal their ideas. No, and, uh, and as, as I said... We know uh, from other inventions. Exactly, exa- so. exactly. He was, he was always very careful 
to, to protect everything that was in the US. Not so handy when things were registered in other countries. That's when he sometimes came a cropper with stuff that was patented in Canada, for instance. I think there was um, some argy-bargy with that. But uh, yeah, Edison wanted to protect what he had invented. I guess you can understand that. So here, this brings us to the last and probably the most plausible and to me what actually happened, which is patricide, yes. We pay visit to Dijon and to Albert, who was the, his brother and who was the last person to see him alive. We only know that Louis was on the train because Albert says he dropped him at the station. We only can take his word for it. And the reason why Louis was there was because they were sorting out his mother's estate. And as we know that most murders involve family and invariably can involve money. So to me, Occam's razor would suggest that um, I, d I doubt Louis ever made it to the train station. And, you know, I'm sure Albert probably found a fantastic place to hide him. And I sadly think, in, in my mind, that uh, Albert kind of wanted to keep all the inheritance on his own and didn't really much want to share it with a brother who was never in the country and obviously he was on the precipice of potential great success. Also, wasn't there a case that he had borrowed money from his mum or something as well? So he knew that uh, Louis was a drain on the family's the family. finances, possibly, mm -hmm. could and be. therefore on his finances. Yeah, that could be another big motivation that he didn't want to be... You see his money, or yes. his family's money, disappear mm -hmm. in Louis's stupid invention. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it could be the fact that Albert completely misdirected the, the search, which wasn't hugely a Scotland Yard and the, the French police did search for him, but not extensively. Yeah, but we're talking 1890. Yeah. So there we go. For, for me, my money's on Albert. If I was a betting kind of a gal, I would definitely be be, be looking to towards Albert. The, the, the Le Prince family, sadly, wouldn't uh, be free of untimely deaths. John Whitley, the, the father-in-law with the, with the business, he would sadly end up in an asylum and go insane a couple of years after um, Louis went missing. We, yeah. don't, we don't think that's the guilt. Oh, <laughs> I don't think so. I know that's probably a predilection. Um, I don't know, or just the strain of trying to ho have a, have a business that doesn't ever seem to be that successful. And then, of course, I think even more sadly was Adolf, who was Lizzie and uh, Louis's son, who was a great champion of of his father. He worked on the projection unit that Louis m made in conjunction with the single lens camera. So he was very close to his father. And on Fire Island in New York in 1901, he uh, died suddenly due to a hunting accident. Although it's a fishy one as well, because I read he died of a revolver shot, yeah. which you don't use mm -hmm. for hunting. No. So well, that's kind of fishy, but I haven't yeah. looked more into that. So we have a father and son death, which are... But he had also been involved in the trial. He had, against, yes. Was it against Edison? Edison was in the midst of suing another company. And this other company, in order to lay claim of the fact that Edison wasn't the sole inventor of the moving image, called on Adolf. And Adolf was on the witness stand... Um, but he was, I think he was barred from mentioning or showing any of, of uh, the actual okay. images. And, and that's how Edison managed to completely undermine Le Prince's patent, which he finally got through from Washington. He didn't amend the patent in the States. He still talked about all the numbered lenses. He never changed it to being a single lens. Therefore, it wasn't the same. Therefore, Edison's was the first and original single lens. And that's how he managed to, say, overturn this this case. But if we say that Edison got Louis killed because he yeah. wanted his invention, it would make sense that he would kill the son who was involved in the development it, and had testified against him. It, in very trial. true, very true. So if he murdered once, he would murder again. Yeah, I still why not? don't see that as pl <laughs> plausible. No, it's probably not very plausible, but... If, he ha if we accept he's done one, it's mm -hmm. not surprising he would have done the other one. Yeah. 
to me, it could have just been, you know, one of these things that maybe one of the guys did have a revolver. I certainly know that the uh, there are a lot of hunting accidents in France. Quite, there's one or two a year, yeah. Yeah, well, and that's with the the much more stringent guidelines and laws in place. Maybe it, it was a lot, lot less, a lot more cavalier, shall we say, possibly. Mm. But I, I think to me, um, it's it's a sad story. Um, I think the the work of Louis Le Prince was groundbreaking, and in the UK, in places of interest, there is a blue plaque placed up on buildings or monuments, and it outlines what happened there, or of a person of note um, had visited there, had been there, and in one of the bridges in Leeds. The the bridge, in fact, where Louis had made one of the first films, there is a blue plaque for him. He he seems to be not swept under the carpet so much. There's also films. There's a documentary about him. There's um, a Hungarian film Hungarian student, Hungarian student, who's yeah, who's a film as well, yeah. yeah, on the last days, on the train journey. Mm-hmm. I, I certainly think that he's he's an interesting character. All of the papers are still in private hands, but Lizzie had had written a memoir, which if you presumably if you were really so desperate, you'd probably hunt it down. University of Leeds holds some of the archive papers, uh, which contain some information about the the camera its itself and the technical drawings for the camera and for lighting equipment. It um, was nothing that he patented the multi-lens camera mm-hmm. in several places, the single lens in the UK, but yeah. he never patented the projectors. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the which he he got parts from from the Lumieres. He he got uh, stuff from them, so it's kind of like he must have been in 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 terms of the inner circle of people who were rushing towards getting this first moving image, you know, to 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 the public. They they must have all known him. Oh yeah. And 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 it is sad. And I think most interestingly about Le Prince, the the last thing is you can actually visit replicas of the cameras that that, that he had made, which is in the National Science and Media Museum in Bradford in London. But uh, that's a rather I think sad story of Louis Le Prince. A bit different from what we normally do. No no murder as such. No body. But an interesting tale nevertheless. I think my yeah. moral is always make sure that you have specific patents. Say what you mean. Be specific. You can never be too specific for a patent. <laughs>